A number of studies have investigated why people go into teaching, and a majority of teachers list matters of the heart as an important factor. They want to contribute to society, make a difference in the world. They care about kids and want to help them maximize their potential. Or they love their content and want to inspire others to love it too. Teachers are passionate people, drawn to meaningful work. For me, the story of why I went into the classroom starts when I was young. Not quite that young, actually, third grade, but I like the first photo better. <laughs> in the third grade, a dash of dyslexia mixed together with a heap of ADD at exactly the time in school when reading becomes central to everything. I don't actually remember my third grade teacher. I, I think I might have blocked it out somehow. So we'll call her Mrs. Smith. <laughs> but I do remember my third grade experience. I was constantly frustrated and depressed. I knew that I could do it. I understood the stuff that was explained to me. But I kept falling further and further behind because I read so slowly and, and the assignments just didn't make any sense. To hear my parents tell it, when they heard me say that I couldn't wait until I died so that I didn't have to go to school anymore, they knew it was time to act. They pulled me from my present school and sent me to a small school in our area that specialized in teaching students with learning differences. They didn't use the term learning disability. They had a philosophical objection to it. Since then, I've had some amazing teachers that have made such a difference for me. Miss Egley in fifth grade, my high school newspaper advisor, Mrs. Jepson, Mrs. Warner, my senior English teacher, now Dr. Warner. I remember Mr. Jameson taught me seventh grade American history, which is the only history class that I ever remember loving. And the list goes on. Teachers are so important and make such an impact on their students. I went into the classroom so I could be one of those teachers, a teacher that makes a significant difference in the lives of his students. I walked into the classroom on my first day with wide-eyed idealism, ready to change the world. And like most teachers, I realized pretty quickly that it wasn't going to be quite as easy as I thought. <laughs> Lee Shulman has said that classroom teaching is quite possibly the most complex, challenging, demanding, subtle, nuanced, and frightening activity that the human species has ever invented. <laughs> I think he's right. It makes me crazy when people say that teaching is easy. You're done by three, you get your summers off. They have no idea. Teachers have to meet federal, state, and local mandates. They have to teach the approved curriculum according to a tight curriculum calendar. They have to develop, give, and grade assignments. They also have to teach new material, identify and correct student misunderstandings, deal with David, who just said something really mean to Lydia, dry Lydia's tears, help Mary, who's lost and just doesn't get it, and keep Sam focused on his work instead of on the squirrel outside the window. <laughs> All at the same time. And while they're doing all those things, we expect our teachers to assess and understand the unique needs of very different students. Learning styles, interests, preferences, background, prior knowledge, special needs. Different students have different needs, and we expect our teachers to meet those needs. Teaching is a Herculean task. I challenge anyone to try it for a year. To do it successfully, teachers have to assess their students. And assessment isn't just the chapter test or the pop quiz either. There's diagnostic, formative, and summative assessment that teachers need to use before, during, and after instruction to monitor student understanding. Ongoing assessment is a vital component of teaching and learning. If classroom teaching is the most complex, challenging, and demanding task ever invented, I bet classroom assessment is the second most. And maybe that's why. As a society, we keep taking assessment out of the hands of classroom teachers. It's okay, we tell them. We know it's difficult, so we'll take care of it. And then we put our faith and our public dollars into the state test. Which means we're going to shut down all teaching for a week or two in late March or early April to give the test. <laughs> and then we wait around for a couple of months to get the scores back and see how we did. The problem with that, the problem, okay, there's lots of problems with that. But not nearly enough time to go into them all. So one of the problems with that is that a single summative assessment does a very bad job of filling in for diagnostic and formative assessment. Remember, ongoing assessment is a vital component of teaching and learning. So think about it this way. There's two ways to know if you're driving too fast. Most people check the speedometer to assess their speed and compare it to the standard. 
the posted speed limit. By the way, it's better if you do that frequently and not just once on your journey. Just saying. Um, but you can also tell that you're driving too fast if you look back and see blue lights in the mirror. <laughs> We've got some pretty sophisticated speed detection devices too. Radar, lasers, aerial surveillance, speed cameras. You don't even have to know you did anything wrong. You can get a ticket mailed to you a couple of months later. Which actually sort of reminds me of getting bad results back on the state test. Now, don't get me wrong. We need police officers with good detection devices. And we need for them to write speeding tickets. But we also need good speedometers, too. Speeding tickets can't replace them. So what if we stopped investing in giving better and better tickets and started investing in better speedometers? Now, I, I don't want to extend my metaphor too far, so let me bring it back to the classroom. As, as part of my doctoral program, I had the opportunity to help develop the teacher work sample for use at my institution. The teacher work sample is a reflective project that teacher candidates use in their last semester during student teaching. They have to plan and teach a unit of instruction and give a pre and a post assessment to measure student growth. As part of the assignment, they also have to graph student learning results, which is a task that not all of them felt completely prepared to do. No worries, I told them. I'm a big enough geek, I'll make a spreadsheet for you. You put in your scores, you get the graphs that you need. And wait, while we've got the data there, I'll give you some graphs that are just nice to have as well. The results blew me away. These teacher candidates started to talk about how important it was to analyze their data and how much they got out of it. They noticed things in their data that they might not have seen otherwise because it was made accessible to them. A table full of numbers may have lots of really great information, but our brains are wired to interpret visualizations like these more effectively. You might not believe me. It's okay, I'll give you an example. I'm sure you can all see instantly what's going on in this classroom. <laughs> so what do you notice here? What do you see in this data? No, sorry. David's at it again. Mary's got a question. Sam's off task. You've got work to do. But what if I showed you the data this way? It probably doesn't take you too long to notice these three students who didn't do any better on the post assessment. In fact, two of them got worse. And if I examine this data a little bit more closely, I'll notice that for these three students, English is not their native language. In fact, English learners showed smaller overall gains in this classroom than other students. That's data I can respond to now by changing the way I teach those students. The teacher candidates that I worked with were able to use this kind of analysis to identify students that needed extra support or students that needed enrichment and extension and give it to them. This kind of diagnostic informative information informed their teaching so they could make adjustments now, the same way that we adjust our speed after looking at the speedometer before we get a ticket. This data acted as a gauge for them. It wasn't tied to consequences. See, our teachers teach for at least 180 days a year. And the state test presumes to use a single annual data point to evaluate the whole thing and make high stakes decisions. For example, if third grade students don't score high enough on the test, they must be held back and repeat third grade. And if a teacher's students don't show high enough learning gains, that teacher could be paid less or even fired, all based on a 0.6% sample? That doesn't make any sense to me. When third grade students are reduced to tears or become physically ill because they're so stressed out about the test, when genuinely good teachers leave the profession because they just can't cope with the uncertainty? There's got to be a better way. What if there was a way to use teachers' classroom assessments as multiple data points throughout the school year instead of just the one state test? These assessments would all be smaller. They'd be less intrusive. They'd be directly tied to the content taught. And they'd be much lower stakes. If a student has a bad day, it wouldn't doom them or their teacher because there's plenty of other days in the sample. See. We've tied so many rewards and consequences to the state test that I think it's changed the character of our school system for the worse. The public dialogue about education, standardized tests, and test scores seems to have us all convinced that our schools are packed full of terrible teachers. There's one around every corner, and it's our civic duty to find them and fire them. <laughs> We've turned teachers into the adversary instead of into the partners that we know they need to be. And I believe it's completely wrong. Do bad teachers exist? 
absolutely. But they're absolutely in the minority. The vast majority of teachers are good people who want what's best for their students and who work ridiculously hard to give it to them. In fact, I'm convinced that even my third grade teacher, Mrs. Smith, was a good person who wanted what was best for me. <laughs> for whatever reason, she either didn't understand what I needed or wasn't, didn't feel equipped to give it to me. And I'll be honest, I know what that's like. I've been there with some of my students too. But what if Mrs. Smith had access to better classroom data systems? What if the assignments and assessments that she gave could be quickly scored and analyzed so that she, she could have seen the pat pattern plainly? I can almost hear her say, Matthew, I've been looking at my data and I've noticed that you're pretty smart. You do well with some complex content, but you seem to do poorly on assignments that involve reading passages. Maybe we can do something about that. Which brings me to the question of the day. What do we do about all of this? Well, for starters, I think we need to stop looking for lousy teachers. There are too many good teachers out there for us to waste our time stewing over the few that don't make the mark. We need to become advocates for our teachers. We need to celebrate their successes, and we need to work with them. The best instructional decisions are made by the ones closest to the student, the ones that understand the student best. By definition, that's the student, the student's family, and the classroom teacher. That should be the core educational team. And once you start to bring people into the mix that work further away from the student than that, especially once you get outside the school building, you begin to dilute the power of that partnership. Yes, the school board superintendent and district staff do have an impact on student learning, but it's far less direct. And the state capital is even further away from the core than that. Data drives the public conversation about education. And right now, that data comes from the state test. But what if there was a way to let teachers generate standardized scores in their own classrooms with their own assessments? See, once I started studying statistics and assessment, I realized that standardized tests don't give standardized results because some highly trained super genius wrote them. We get standardized results because we have a lot of data on each of those questions. Before any one item on the state test is used to generate a student's score, it was given to at least 2,000 other students so the authors could see how the item performs and collect the data they need to standardize it. Students in our state answer 45 questions, but only 30 of them count. The other 15 are being piloted for next year. Now, depending on how many students they serve in a typical year, it would take one teacher anywhere from 10 to more than 100 years to give the same question to that many students. But what if? What if we created an open collaborative network that allowed teachers to share assessment items with one another? Then multiple teachers from virtually anywhere could use the same item in their assessments. With a week or so, we could collect the data we need to standardize it. And once an item's been vetted, it can do all the same stuff for us that the state test items do. We could use the item response theory to generate high confidence proficiency estimates, drive computer adaptive testing systems, and generate standardized scores instantly. Imagine if teachers could generate that kind of data in their own classroom in a matter of minutes instead of waiting months for the results of the state test. Then maybe teachers could drive the conversation about education. Teachers who work with students and their families to make a difference in their lives, creating a positive ripple effect for our society. That's the kind of system I wanna see and one that I'm working to create. Let's give teachers back the keys and let them drive. Thank you.